Welcome to this Seven Cities event. We're in conversation with uh, our Mayor, uh, Andy Burnham, for those that don't uh, know him, where we be. Um, and we're going to have a bit of a conversation about what's going on, some of his thoughts about where we are. And obviously, uh, we're going to start with the issue or the announcement or non-announcement. And I mean, that's not where I was going to start. But it's uh, inevitable that we will start on H2. But before I even do that, I think it's right to say congratulations on the launch of the B Network. You Thank should be. You. you must be really pleased. Yeah, really, really proud, uh, Andrew. And actually, to be honest, as people have built the case for this way before me, this has been a Greater Manchester team effort over many, many years. Um, Sir Richard, Sir Howard, but you know, councillors before them as well. So a proud moment for us. We're back in control of our buses. Uh, but as just as we're doing that, someone else is pulling the rug from under us somewhere else. But uh, you know, there you go. That's okay. it. That's life, eh? Let me. Um, is there feedback on the? There can is, you hear? Yeah. What can we do? Uh, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be annoying after a while. Um, okay. So, yes. Well. So having moved from yeah. good news, maybe. So obviously, it's it's rumour. We don't know if it's been formally announced, but yeah. it seems to be the case that um, if they haven't already made the, the announcement, they've made the decision that essentially they're going to can the HS2 uh, certainly into the, the Manchester leg. And your thoughts on that? Well, we're still in the dark as, as well, though. You know, this is so wrong on so many levels that there's conversations going on in hotel rooms, sort of, you know, kind of stone's throw from where we are about the future, basically, of, the north of England and its economy because it's that it's that crucial and we're just shut out completely and you know how can this be right how can it be justified given that it's almost 10 years since George Osborne came to this city and said you are going to get it all HS2 HS3 as he called it at the time platforms 15 and 16 at Piccadilly you name it we were going to get it and then Boris comes what was it five years after that and said in front of Stevens and Drop it, oh no, we're gonna, oh, I wasn't gonna do an impression, I won't, I won't do it. So I'm not in a, mood. I'm not in a happy enough mood to, uh, to give them any credit. Yeah, but you can't do that, can you? You can't come and say all of that again, five years later. And then here we are, um, where it feels as though they're getting ready to pull, pull the plug on all of it. And this will be remembered, won't it, as the, the conference when they came here and they, they pulled the plug on us. Would they do it to other parts of the country? I keep asking that. What gives them the right to treat people here in Greater Manchester and across the north of England as second-class citizens when it comes to transport? What gives them the right to do that? And I just find it profoundly depressing, actually, at a point when they've come back to our city region, you can see the skyscrapers, you can see the change, you can feel the place moving forward, the city's doing well. Hopefully you can feel it as you're, you're here. And we're growing faster than the UK economy. We were predicted to do so. We're, we're a success story. And then behind you, you've got a government working against you. It's just like, it's just not right. It's not fair. Not, not disrespectful to us, but to the people of the North of England. Wherever they are on HS2, I think there'll be a consensus across the North of England that this is no way at all to treat this part of the world, given the promises that, that they've made. And, and so obviously, get to the nature of the, the decision or the predicted decision, but um, you've had in no way any engagement with the government and with the ministers who are ultimately making the decision about the process that they're going through. You haven't been informed, you haven't been involved in those conversations? No, I, I wrote to the Prime Minister and the Chancellor with the leader of Manchester City Council a week ago. To my knowledge, we've not had a reply. Um, we said we were open to a conversation about how things could be rephased. Uh, so we weren't just saying, you know, stick to the plan at any cost. We'd be open to a conversation about cost, you know, how can you reduce the cost? But, you know, to be shut out completely and to hear ministers over the weekend, no, we're not commenting on speculation. Who created the speculation? Who created the uncertainty? And obviously that has an impact on us from a sort of inward investment point of view. So it, it just feels wrong on, on every level. And, you know, I just don't think that other parts of the country would get treated in this way. If this railway goes from sort of out to London through the home counties, the Chilterns, and ends up in, in Birmingham, it will be a sort of permanent kind of monument of the places that Whitehall cares about. It will link the places that they bother about. 
and it will tell the rest of the country what, what they think of us. Yeah. And I should have said at the beginning, so I'm going to have the conversation with Andy that I want to have uh, for about 20 minutes. And I know there's lots of people in the room, particularly the media, that want to have a different conversation. You'll have to wait. I apologise for that, but that's the way it is. Uh, and then when we get to, to, to questions, I will take some um, from the media, by all means. But essentially, then we'll stop and we'll have the conversation. Yeah. We'll, get, we'll get questions from non-media people as well. So, you know, you'll just have to bear with me on that. That's just the way it is. The, the event it is what it is. Can I just say, uh, Andrew, actually, though, we're going to have an event with myself and the leader of Manchester City Council straight after this. And we'd rather do it together, really, when we're kind of doing it in a more kind of structured way. But I mean, we'll, I will answer questions, but well, I think it would be better yeah. if we could do it at the yeah. end of the event. Yeah. So part of that, I mean, it is still a similar theme, but I, I think it's been interesting. It says a little bit around, you know, the mayors as institutions, as organisations, that you know, there's common cause on this issue, right? It's, it's not just a Labour mayor complaining about the Conservative government because we've had Andy Street and Ben Houchin, and, you know, both of them expressing quite withering criticism of, uh, you know, of the process and such. It tells a little bit about common cause, do you think? Well, one of them, I would say, uh, I'm not sure about two, um, but certainly uh, Andy Street mm -hmm. has been really strong. Um, and I've been speaking to Andy yeah. over recent days. <clears throat> I just think it's critical for Birmingham as well as us, because often people think about, oh well, it's all about getting quicker to Manchester. Hang on a minute, has anyone tried to do the journey from Birmingham to Manchester by train? Manchester to Birmingham, it's not an easy journey. It takes far too long, it takes over an hour. And actually that bit of the line was a really justified part of it. And you know, when I hear the government sort of talking about cost or the costs are out of control, well, who let the costs get out of control, but why did they spend tens of millions of pounds tunnelling it under the fields in the Chilterns for no economic benefit whatsoever to tell us up here in the north that the money's run out? I mean, that is a question they've got to answer. You know, you cannot just sort of oversee this project for kind of 13 years and almost say it's, you know, finally they're just Come up, come up with a decision. They've mismanaged it all the way, but it's the North are going to pay the price of this mismanagement. And, and notwithstanding, as you say, we still wait for uh, whatever the announcement is. I mean, what's the next step for you and for you know for the other mayors, but particularly you in trying to either influence them in their in revisiting the announcement or moving forward? I mean, yeah, I'll lay that out at three thirty. Okay. So I have got something to say about that that will be quite specific. So rather than you know, we'll do it in a in a structured way. Way then, if that's so. Yeah. Uh, okay, Andrew, but I, I think the kind of maybe last point on this is I, I think this goes further than just the Conservative Party where it's up to and the point in the electoral cycle. These are bigger questions that now need to be asked about how this country is run mm -hmm. and whether it's run in the interests of all people in all places and whether all places are equal. I, I am on record as saying I don't believe the North South divide is an accident, it's national yeah. policy. It's the way Whitehall works, and I know that because I've been in the middle, the middle of it. The, the way we run things in this country leads to the kind of decisions that we, we are, are expecting soon, and that is uh, we have a system of, of kind of looking at infrastructure and giving more investment to the places where the economy is already is already strongest, and we're seeing that being played out again. And so, you know, what I'd like to get, maybe we could get onto it in this conversation, I've been calling for the complete rewiring of the country. Power needs to work very differently in this, in this country. Decisions need to be taken very differently. Because the way they're taken in the, in the Whitehall system is, is not fair. Uh, it's actually widening the North-South divide. And I think we've hit that point now with devolution. That's where I feel that we are. We, we I would say we've been the most functional level of government in recent years, the combined authorities. Uh, we've been the last bastion of stable government in the United Kingdom. We've not, we've not been changing our, our course. Um, and I think what we found though is it's been increasingly difficult with a chaotic Whitehall and Westminster yeah. system, sort of, uh, you know, almost cutting across everything that we're trying to do. So it feels to me that we've hit a moment here, you know, this country is not being run properly, and I'm not just talking about the current government, just generally it's not working for everybody. And we need now some serious conversations about how we get functional decision making, functional government in all parts of the country. And how do you, I mean, maybe you can't, maybe you can't, I don't know, but can you rationalise 
how you know, the government on the one hand acts in the way it has on this issue, but yet has also then engaged with you on you know, trailblazer-led conversations about devolution 2.0, etc., etc. How et cetera. Et cetera. How, do you, how do you reconcile them, you know, having both of those sort of thoughts in their, in their head at the same time? What, what does that say to you? Yeah, it's hard to reconcile um, because, you know, I've been on record as saying when they get things right, I'll say uh -huh. so, when they get things wrong, I'll say so, and yeah. they got that right earlier this year, and we were, we were proud to sign that, that trailblazer deal, but it starts to feel like one step forward, two steps back. You know, we are showing in this city region that you can make levelling up real. It looks different Manchester today than the Manchester they were in at their last conference in 2021. It has... It has become more impressive in its scale and its stature. Um, the investment is coming in. And, you know, who would want, you know, if you were in your 20s or 30s, you know, would you want to live in zone 6 on the Piccadilly line and pay, what is it, about eight quid for a pint? No, of course you wouldn't. <laughs> would you want to live in Manchester City Centre? And How much know? is a pint? Oh, well, you can, one, you can get one from under a fire. That's true. That the is places true. that I go to. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> Well, if they know where you go, then the, pipe, the prices will go up because everybody will be going. <laughs> but it's a serious point. You know, people want to come here. It's a very different Manchester than the one I was forced to leave in the early 90s when I graduated because I couldn't find anything here. That old thing that anyone of my generation had to sort of do to get on in life, you had to go south. And that was true of pretty much everywhere else in the north, uh -huh. wasn't it? That was, our, that was our kind of life. That's what we had to do. It's not the case now in the city today. But if you kind of do something to sort of derail that and undermine that confidence, you know, how UK government will, will justify that or forgive themselves, I honestly don't know. It's a kind of really bewildering moment, I find, that we're at the moment. Yeah, I know it is a very good point. Right, let's open it up to uh, some uh, questions. Karen Brennan, Head of Future Mobility for ACOM. Um, I believe you opened our office just recently. I did. I did indeed. I'm interested to know, given the uncertainty around infrastructure development in the North West of England, we've obviously got a huge number of people who've been supporting you to deliver mobility changes, the future of transport in Manchester. How do you see the uncertainty at the moment affecting the skills for young people and professional people trying to build professional careers in the North West of England? I mean, to get on to a more positive sort of footing, yeah. We can't let it, I guess. You know, you, you'll get the burst of frustration which you've, you've had at the start of this conversation, but when we kind of get over that, we can't let it, I think. And we're really proud of the fact that we do have organisations like yours in our, in our city providing thousands of really great jobs for people. And it's good, the partnership we have, isn't it? The way we work on developing the B network and, and other things. And the, and the answer is we can't let it derail us. Um, we've got to um, keep uh, our focus um, on what we can do and if I'm elected for a third term as Mayor of Greater Manchester I will be making the integration of technical education as much of an obsession in my third term as I've made integrating transport an obsession in my second term because to me what, what English devolution is doing is fixing the fundamentals the things that are holding us back and have been holding us back for a long time, fragmented transport, a fragmented skills system, uh, you know, a really poor quality housing uh, system. I, I think the, the, the job I've got to do as mayor is kind of fix those fundamentals so that we can keep building the economy on stronger foundations. And technical education is the is the big one that's in my sights. Could you say I, a little bit more about that? And yeah, in so terms of what your, you know, what the ambition is. It's simple, Andrew. It's two clear, equal routes at fourteen for all young people growing up in Greater Manchester. One academic, the university route, and another technical, uh, work, working towards uh, work. And I think that is something again that is Whitehall created over the years. You know, an English education system that's absolutely dominated by a university. Now, don't get me wrong. In a city of great universities, we're really proud of them and, and the university route. But only a third of our kids got on that university route. And how can anyone justify anymore that we've not got something clearer and more positive to say to the two thirds of kids who don't go on the university route? Um, so we're we're on a mission to fix that uh, because we think the kind of future prosperity of our city region depends upon that. 
and actually the confidence of investors depends upon fixing at that. So the idea is to mirror the English baccalaureate, which is how schools, secondary schools are judged, which is a collection of GCEs based on university requirements, we want to bring in the Greater Manchester Baccalaureate. So at 14, we give young people in Greater Manchester clear information about the qualifications that employers here in our city region most value. Engineering GCSE, drama GCSE, art and design GCSE, music GCSE, business studies, computer science as a sort of standard, whatever you're, you're, you're doing. We're trying to create a kind of parallel route. And then at 16, we want to signpost young people to the parts of the Greater Manchester economy that are going to be the strongest in the future. So we've got seven gateways. And there we want to have new qualifications. T-levels, we're happy to work with the government on T-levels. Uh, but T-levels with work placements from some of the big employers who are now in the city region. So I was really proud last week to announce that BBC, ITV, Siemens, um, BMY, Bank of New York, Mellon, BMY Mellon, um, Kraft Heinz over in, in Wigan, Sevens Construction. These big players are backing the Greater Manchester Baccalaureate. And I want them to then offer the work placements linked to the T-levels so that then young people can apply for them in the same way that they apply for university through UCAS. We've created a system called GMAX. We want to use as a single portal so that a young person in Tameside or Rochdale or Oldham has got a line of sight from where they are in their life to something in the city region, in the city centre, that represents a real, real achievable yeah. route for them. And for me, that is you know, what we've got to do with all of our partners in business. We've got to build a skill system based on a high degree of collaboration, high degree of integration, uh, and the same way that we've kind of can we glue transport back together, we've got to glue the skill system back together and create an employer-driven system. And that will put us, in my view, ahead of London or ahead of anywhere in the South uh, in terms of a place to come and invest. And I, I hate to always put it like that, but I've got to put it like yeah, that yeah, because yeah. You know, we've got to kind of constantly give reasons to people to come here. And I'll come to you just in a second, just to, just to finish up on that. And it, mm -hmm. What is it, do you, do you need a bunch of stuff from, let's say, government in order to make that ambition reality? In the same way as, you know, to get the B Network, we needed the Bus Franchising Act, which we got, which was brilliant, and you were obviously instrumental in making that happen. But is there a bunch of stuff that you'll, that you'll need in order to realise the, you know, that ambition for the, for the education system? Well, we've got a commitment in that trailblazer devolution deal that you yeah. mentioned, yeah. that is about giving us a greater role in post-16 technical education. Yeah. Um, I guess what we need beyond that is, is buy-in. Mm -hmm. So I did an event with Robert Halfen this morning and honestly we were talking the same language yeah. on, on this type of issue. And I said, well let's make this a cross-party endeavour. The Department for Education are often kind of the most difficult to deal with because they have a very, I would say, slightly ivory tower view of education. And the English baccalaureate that I mentioned, or the EBAC, I mean that is the measure that's used to judge all schools at the moment. And it is the university route. Yeah. And, and They've got to, in this part of the world at least, allow us to offer something more compelling yeah. to the kids who yeah. are not on that yeah. route. The Secretary of State was quoted recently saying, oh, we can't have something different in Manchester than we've got in Liverpool. But actually, why not? Because the market, the labour market is different here than it is in, in Liverpool. And if we, if we adopt that thinking, we will never fix technical education yeah. in this country. It has to be devolved by definition. And I'm not saying we do something wildly different. I think the Greater Manchester Baccalaureate, you know, with those subject choices at 14, the kind of higher qualifications at 16 that people apply to, and then even beyond that to apprenticeships and degree apprenticeships. I would imagine the template we could create would be 90% the same anywhere in the country. So, you know, everybody would want digital yeah. qualifications, yeah. retrofitting. Yeah. But it, it's just going to be an element of difference that each of the areas has to insert into it. So in Birmingham it might be automotive, in Liverpool it might be marine and ports. Uh, here it might be you know, advanced manufacturing materials. Yep. Um, the point being that you create a standardised approach, but then can be localised. Yep. And the reason why I'm sticking out for the MBAC, or the Greater Manchester Baccalaureate, is because the name of it 
makes it relevant to the kids you're trying yes, to engage. Absolutely. If they can hear that this is about them and their world, where they live, where they expect to work, yeah. then they will engage with it, I think, uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll go on that route. <coughs> so we're holding out for it, and what do I need then? The answer is more buy-in from the government, okay. not opposition, work with us on it, let's yeah. do it together, let's create, let's fix technical education, go to Manchester, <laughs> and then take it take it around the country, because the MBAC becomes a BBAC in Birmingham or a, an LBAC in Leeds or Liverpool. Yeah, brilliant, okay. No, it's, it's a good question, because um, we've had health devolution here, yeah. uh, an element of it, for five years, and you might ask, well, what did that achieve? What I would point you to is a report by The Lancet that came out this time last year, actually. Yeah, it was. It was this time, it was, we were yeah. doing this in the yeah, 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 it had just come yeah. out. Uh, and Basically, it said that life expectancy had increased here faster than expected um, through devolution, and it had been most marked in our more deprived communities. And the reason they put down for that was the kind of sense of one system, so health in all policies, all parts of the system pulling pulling together. You know, the health service here has, has helped fund my bed every night scheme. You know, that's that tonight will look after about 550 people who would otherwise be sleeping rough in the city region. That changes people's health straight away. You know, it's catastrophic for your health, mental health, if you're to go onto the streets. And so, it's that whole system approach, I think, that that makes the difference. Um, we were doing huge work pre-pandemic on school readiness. You know, the kids who health visitors had identified as likely not to be school ready at age two, if everything carried on the same. We were really intervening early and we closed the gap for kids on free school meals with the rest of England. Again, that's an example of that, everyone pulling in the same direction approach. Um, that, I think, makes the difference. And we were just discussing this at our integrated care partnership on, on Friday. <coughs> to me, it's about a social model before a medical model. I don't think you can kind of treat your way to a, better, a more healthy population. What you have to do is change the reality of things in people's workplaces, in their homes, in their communities, um, and the support that you give them to improve their work, improve their homes, that in the end builds health. Um, and you know that's what we're pursuing really, more of a social model rather than a medical model when it comes to health improvement. Great, Great. excellent, yep. yes sir. Thank you, Tony Samuels, a banker, a lawyer, businessman, and it's great to hear Andy that you're actually working together cross party. But the tragedy of HS2, very briefly, is that even if it was working today, on Saturday, we wouldn't have been able to get here, yeah. and on Wednesday, we couldn't get back. Yeah. If you were in government, what would you have done? It's a, on that particular issue, you mean? I, I get around the table. Um, I, negotiation is an important art, and it's an art that all ministers need to, need to, need to learn. You've got to negotiate your way out of out of these situations, you know, there's always a deal to be done. People can have whatever view they like of the trade unions, but they will negotiate. Um, and I've just been frustrated at times to see this kind of pullback. And I, I mean, like I, you, you know, I can speak from experience. We never had an NHS strike in, in all my time in, in, in the Department of Health. <laughs> no, no, nothing. Yeah, well, no, because no, we negotiate. It's difficult. Yeah, no. But hey, but listen. The BMA, they're the toughest trade union yeah, of them all, I know like that, them, yeah. but, but we always would negotiate, and I I do worry a bit, I don't want to make too much of a political point, but there's, there's a bit of one here, I think in the social media age, I notice a change in the way politics is being conducted, and bear in mind, I was in Parliament for 16 years, eight pre-social media, eight post-social media. And I've often, I've described it as like playing a different sport for the first eight years. It was like football became rugby league overnight, you know, because all of a sudden it was contact sport proper and you, you, know, it was, you were getting battered about a lot, a lot more. And I think the way politicians, that's changed politicians' behaviour, I, I think. I mean, it's easy for me to say because I've never been a minister in the social media era. And I'm, I'm sure it's tougher than it was when I was a minister. So let me just be fair about that. But what I think social media does it creates a polarised environment where people start playing to the polarised environment rather than reaching <laughs> into solutions. And, and I, I kind of see that's infected government, I think. And, and I think you just 
got to remember that you're a minister of the crown being for everybody and you've got to pull people together, you've got to lead people back together, that's the job. And I really feel that that's kind of gone a bit and that hence things are too polarised, things aren't working, things have gone backwards. That's, that's my view. Just on that, Andy, I mean, you, you use, uh, as the mayor, you use social media a lot to, to communicate and to, to receive communication. Just say a little bit about how that approach has evolved for you and what you found as a result of that. Yeah, so it's, it's hard, you know, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it isn't, but I try to use it to point to the positives that we're, that we're doing. Yeah. And where there's, you know, come back, I, you know, you can't answer every uh, tweet that you get, but you can try, I do try and answer, uh, answer a lot of them, because I don't think you can just broadcast away on social media, that's not the point of it, is it? So, it's actually a really important tool for somebody in my job, because, you know, in a mayoral role compared to a ministerial role, you're on the ground, you know, you need to hear people. The B Network launched and it was bumpy for a few days and still is a bit, to be honest, and you have to get that feedback and use it and use it positively. Yeah. So I have no, I have no problem uh, with that. Um, and I think it, in the mayoral role, I think it, it, you're doing it not in a sort of, you know, a high level way. It's, you can kind of use it to, to good effect. Yeah. It's still challenging, yeah. of course. Because it's part of a broader point we hear often or sometimes from different interests about you know, accountability and interaction, right? in a sense of who you are accountable to, we need to make you more accountable. You know, we've seen a little bit of that in the level up white paper, and I can see you smiling already. But, you know, so just say a little bit of, about that, in a sense, it feels to me that one of the advantages of the mayoral model and the way that they go about it is actually yeah. there's a deep, uh, everyday level of accountability. Right? Well, I feel that. I, I hear people saying, you know, I'm not accountable and, uh, you know, it's, well, I don't, honestly, I, I think when you're in the sort of, uh, inside the Westminster bubble all week, then you, right. can, you can insulate yourself from a lot of what's going yeah. on. In this role, you can't. You yeah. know, I walk out of my office, I'm straight into the street and people do you were there yeah well I, I like i do my politics like that though so i don't i don't mind that and it's right actually that it's done it's done like like that but i yeah i i used to come over from westminster and you know you've done your thing down there and it was you know a lot of hobnobbing around strangers bar and that kind of thing as, as, as i do and I, I can only say to you when i finish my week here i'm literally like, like that <laughs> whereas there it was like, it was you know it yeah. was uh, busy but never not yeah. quite as all consuming as the mayoral role yeah. um andrew luxton from uh, rural side of berry uh you've said that you've uh, you've not gone to bring in the uh, chargeable U us into manchester because it harms the most poorest people in the area uh will you condemn some account for expanding that down in london no, because I just think the context is completely different. Um, if you take Uxbridge, where the by-election was, um, they've got a transport infrastructure even there in out London that's way beyond what, what people here have got. They've got an underground, if I, if I remember rightly, right in the middle of Uxbridge. Um, so it's, the context is not comparable. All I can, you know, I'm responsible for, for here. Um, there is still a, a legal direction on our councils. Um, you know, this issue isn't, isn't over. I think there is a chance though, and I'm always in the spirit of finding cross-party ways of, ways of working. I, I kind of saw how the world had changed post-pandemic, Bernie. We've been trying to make ours stack up pre-pandemic. It, it was clear to me in the middle of 2021 that the availabil availability of vehicles and the cost of cleaner vehicles had just gone really high. And you know, people here don't have as much disposable income, to be honest, as, as people in other in, in London as well. In London is different from that point of view. It, it just felt to me that people would have been hit with a charge that they couldn't avoid, and that was not meant to be the point. Hence, the decision that we we took back uh, back then. I think there is scope here now, though, for a positive way of saying this is a better way of doing it. So, we, when we renegotiated the legal direction with the government, we deliberately asked for a date of 2026, which is now in the direction of the councils, which crucially gives time for the full effect of the B network to be felt. And actually the evidence I've got from TFGM is that if you back the B network properly and increase the pace of electrification, that can get you to compliant clean air across, across our 10 boroughs. So that's the solution that's right, right for us. I'm not necessarily making a comment on the London situation because I think it's completely different. Yeah, no, very good. Okay, let's do it. Uh, 
Let's take the gentleman there. Sorry, actually, let's take this gentleman here right in front of you, and then I'll come to you, sir. You've had your hand up. Yeah, fire away. Uh, hi, Vintel from Gigpig. Uh, Slash Lord recently put on billboards uh, highlighting that 3.8 million people uh, in, during COVID uh, were left vulnerable. Uh, what does central government need to do to support the nighttime economy? And what did you make of this act as well? Well, I think it's really important that we don't just move on from the pandemic and think, oh, well, that was a bad dream. And, you know, there's, there's people still struggling with the effects of the pandemic. There's kids still struggling with the effects, but definitely freelancers and people who are self-employed in the city have still not recovered financially from, from what they went through. And I, I, again, you know, struggle with policies where it's like with HS2, you cut out the North. How can we just cut out people who have chosen to work freelance or newly self-employed? Um, I, I just still think it's a, a point that shouldn't be shouldn't be forgotten. We spoke up for that group a lot in that in that period because they're a big part of our city. A lot of people work uh, on a freelance basis uh, yeah. Yeah. here. Yeah. And actually, what message does it send? It doesn't it doesn't encourage people to be risk taking, does it? In the future, if when there was a national crisis or an international crisis, they were just cut off and, and left out in the wilderness. So no, uh, you know, Sasha's done a fantastic job speaking up for the nighttime economy, speaking up for the, <coughs> our cultural and creative sector. And um, we, we don't forget here, you know, we, we, we always will kind of speak up for people who, who deserve support. And um, Sasha's done that extremely effectively and we're, we're very grateful to him. So first, on the first part of your question, um, I, I would accept that um, there's more to be done to help all parts of Greater Manchester experience some of the investment that's coming in and what I would point to would be somewhere close to you which is Stockport where they that's went, I know, I understand but I'm just saying it's close to you, I didn't say it was in your borough, where they went for a mayoral development corporation um, five years ago, chaired by Port Kerslake, and, you know, we all miss him greatly, we do, we? What we do. a fantastic individual and what a great service he did, did for us. That actually is the first example, I would say in England, where you can see a town being lifted by its proximity to the city and is a real positive success story. And I think we can replicate that in other parts of the city region. So Farnworth, actually, interestingly, is a town mm -hmm. where we're trying the same now with um, investment in the centre. Uh, Capital and Centric have got a scheme uh, there. You mentioned Alden Rochdale. Well, our biggest single strategic site that we have the highest ambitions for is Atom Valley in the north of the city region. And we will be taking um, new infrastructure up there to realize the full potential of that site. And, and in Thameside, I spoke to Jed uh, about this recently, about our ambitions for the growth location in the east of the city region. And there are big opportunities for, uh, for, for Thameside as part of that. And I'm ready to, to help realize those, those opportunities. In terms of the B network, what the figures you're quoting are a reflection of the failure of central government. This is not just true of the B network, this is true of any bus system anywhere in England outside of London. There is no revenue committed post-2025 uh, revenue support. And the Transport Select Committee, Conservative Chair, have recently said there needs to be a funding deal for local uh, transport authorities outside of London post-2025. So the figures you're quoting are kind of linked to the kind of fact that that isn't committed yet. But, you know, it will have to be the case that there's going to have to be support for bus uh, outside of London post-2025. And, as I say, let, let's not, not play politics here. We've been grateful <coughs> for the support we've had for the B Network so far. The Minister came up and praised the B Network last week. Minister Holden was, it, was in Bolton, praised it as a great success. Um, it now needs backing. And uh, I'm hoping there'll be cross-party support for that. What have you learned? You've been doing the job a while. You're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to be in for a third term, you may get it, you never know, you may not, not take it the, cards, you know, the cards fall in the right way. I mean, but what, would you, what, what have you learnt and what would you pass on in terms of experiences to other places who are thinking about it? I, I, mean, I would say I'm lucky in the, the devolution deals that have been negotiated gave me more. When you've got more, you can make more of it. Um, so I, I think, you know, if, you, if we're committing to devolution as a country, and I think we should, because it's one of the rare points of true cross-party agreement, I think, at, at this moment in time. And the thing about it is it does allow a different form of politics. It allows you to do a place-first rather than a party-first approach. 
Now, okay, politics will always intervene to some degree, but that would be my advice to people. Really live the place first approach. You know, reach out, don't over politicize things, kind of create a space where people from all walks of life, all backgrounds, feel they can kind of come in and work with you. You know, businesses will find that a safer place, space to kind of come in if it's not about the agendas of political parties. And we, we've worked quite hard at that. So even when the Greater Manchester Combined Authority was a three-party um, administration with Conservative-led uh, Councilman Bolton, Lib Dem-led in uh, Stockport, we still kind of worked together. And barely ever did we have votes or dis you know, disagreements in discussion, but not once we'd kind of come through the discussion. You know. So my, my advice would be, Place first rather than party first. You know, you use everything you've got as well as your convening power, because that's a really important power that, that mayors that, that mayors have got. And kind of call it as you see it for your place without over politicking. So if the government get it right, say so. And I've tried to do that and you know, I did praise Michael Gove a lot when, yeah. uh, when that trailblazer was yeah. was negotiated. But if they get it wrong, use every bit of you to call it out as strongly as you can because you've got to, at the end of the day, be a champion for the place or, or, or what are you there for, you know? So uh, that's, I suppose, I suppose how, I would, how I would see it. But I would also say it's a great role. You know, I've been happier in this role than any other, uh, any other time in politics because, kind of like everybody who say, I love this place, I can, can I see it could be so much more as well though. Um, that thing about the kids growing up here, you know, can we give them all a sort of equal path in life? Those things really, really motivate me. And you can't actually at this point, this place, this level, really get your hands on it in a way that you can't in Westminster. I always say you can deal in names, not numbers here. And that makes all the difference, you know, when you're building from the bottom up. So these are great roles. I would want everywhere to be able to time to get more of the, the kind of range of capabilities that Great, great Manchester has got. I think, as a country, I was saying before that we need to sort of rethink how the country yeah. functions. Devolution really has got to be a big part of the mix. And last point, I think Scotland is suffering from not devolving down further to its city regions. They've hoovered it all up to the national level. And I think one of the reasons why Scotland has become a dis dysfunctional is for that precise reason. In many ways, they've mirrored everything they criticise Westminster about. They've kind of mirrored it in Hollywood. And um, that's a problem for them. I think the concept is still sound. The idea of the north of England being more than the sum of its parts by networking them, the, connecting the cities, connecting the universities through the N8. Um, you know, that, is a, that was and is a sound concept. Um, and I kind of thought back to where we started today, the fact that Boris Johnson, Theresa May, David Cameron, George Osborne have all expressed concern about what we might be about to, uh, to, to, to hear, says something really, because they all at different stages were responsible for, for, for building uh, the concept of the Northern Powerhouse. Um, it, it, it has got to be the right thing to do. I went on a mayoral trip to Ireland with Steve Rotherham, the first time two mayors and two city regions had done an overseas visit uh, together. Uh, and it was, it was fantastic because the North of England particularly when we work across some of those, those, uh, those geographical divides, has a, people have an affection for it. There's a, there's a sort of a reach that it has with people that is powerful. And um, I think we do get seen internationally when we, when we, work, as, we work as a North. So I would say, no, the, the concept is still, is still sound. We've brought through the Convention of the North, which is something that's here to stay. I think we're about to see a new pan-regional body being created that is about... Uh, the kind of NP11 as it was becoming a more permanent business oriented body to promote growth. So all of that, all of that is positive. And let's see where this rail announcement gets to. If it is about rephasing things, protecting HS2, but then rephasing the northern investment, you know, well, we'll see, won't we? We'll see. But I mean, I think let's let us not lose the, the concept of the northern powerhouse and let's not let us lose the idea that the north of england can be can be more the risk for us of course is though that if the plug is pulled on all of the rail infrastructure we are looking at a smaller economy in the north of england 
in the rest of the century than we would otherwise have had. And that's why I've been so grateful, Andrew, I've got to be clear about this, to all of the mayors and leaders who at TFN last week spoke with one voice mm -hmm. in favour of, obviously, an issue that directly impacts on Manchester. But there is very much a spirit of One North around these days. And um, I, I, I guess that's only going to grow, to be honest. I think that's a good way to finish. Uh, Andy, as always, it's a great privilege and an honour to, to have you. Thank no, you very much. Andrew, indeed. You're welcome. No Please worries. join me to thank Andy.